for the very nice introduction, and thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. So, uh, as you can see from this title, I'm going to give a very uh, general talk. You know, information theory um, is going through a renaissance uh, these days, so what I want to do in this talk is explore the reasons for this renewed interest in this subject, give uh, a little bit of a historical overview, uh, tell you a little bit of the open problems, in the subject and uh, maybe predict uh, what is the, the flavor of things to come in this field. So um, this is uh, a picture of Claude Shannon taken uh, shortly after uh, he became uh, very famous for this paper in 1948, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. Uh, he wrote this paper in Bell Labs uh, the same year, in the same building that the transistor was invented. And, uh, of course, this paper had a huge, huge impact in the, in the field of communication. And, in fact, is the triumph of mathematics. The reason why today we can do a lot of what we can do is because of mathematics. And it's because of this, the roots are in, all in this paper. So, uh, you know, it's not every, in every engineering discipline that something written in 1948 is still relevant. In fact, technology goes usually much faster and things that are only 10 years old usually are already obsolete. Whereas in this field, maybe because of its mathematical roots, this paper is still very, very relevant. So I want to explore a little bit why. Uh, why this happens. So uh, here I have classified uh, kind of three aspects, three facets of information theory. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking primarily about um, the first facet and also the third facet. So the idea here is that uh, information theory is a theory of fundamental limits meaning that it's a theory that divides the world into what is possible and what is impossible. So, um, as we will see, a lot of these fundamental limits have to do with the notion of redundancy. How much redundancy can we remove from data and still maintain the integrity of the data? How much redundancy we need to add to the data so that we can maintain the integrity of the data when we send it through an unreliable channel. So, in 1948, Shannon came up with three major problems, uh, which I, I list here in black, lossless data compression, lossy data compression, and channel coding. And I'll say more about those next. But there are other problems of, for which you can also uh, formulate information theoretic light like fundamental limits, and here you see some of them. Uh, portfolio allocation is another problem where you can um, you can set out to optimize a function, which is the um, the growth rate of uh, a portfolio allocation, and that turns out to be uh, a problem that uses um, very similar tools to the problems that we use in communications. Uh, the problem of decision, decision theory, hypothesis testing, is another problem that uh, you can also pose very similar optimization-like questions, and um, was developed later in the 1950s, but again, it's very information theoretic. So, uh, usually the way this works is that you pose a problem that is of interest in engineering, like I said before, what is the maximum amount of redundancy that you can remove from data, and then uh, the solution turns out to be a solution that you can express in terms of some mathematical quanti quantities which uh, are information measures. And of course the most famous one is the entropy, uh, but there are others like what we call mutual information or the relative entropies that are extremely important, not only in the theory that was, that was developed by Shannon, but in other branches 
in mathematics and also outside mathematics, uh, they have been used quite a bit. Okay, so the, uh, this is another facet of information theory. I'm not going to mention uh, that much about this, but uh, it's also quite important, even if it's not directly related to engineering applications like in, in the fields that you see listed here. And the third one is uh, the facet of information theory as an engineering design driver. You can imagine that uh, this issue of fundamental limits is like saying, well, the speed of light is so much, but physics is not going to tell us how to reach the speed of light, how to go about building an object that goes close to that limit. So in its pure form, information theory does not tell you either how to approach these limits, but then it has also the facet of giving us insight about designing systems that are efficient. So uh, I will um, I will then start by um, uh, going over some of these applications, uh, some of these technologies where information theory has relevance, and then uh, we'll go back to the aspect of engineering uh, of uh, information theory as a, an engineering design driver. All right, so you are all familiar with the technology of data compression. So in this laptop, uh, there is a program that enables me to um, compress files, maybe before I email them, uh, before I email a picture, um, I want to compress it so that the email message takes less time. Or the PDF uh, presentation that I'm giving, PDF is actually a compressed version of a PostScript language. So um, it sounds rather um, peculiar, the fact that we can actually have a technology that starts with a file this big, then makes it half as big, and then we're able to recover the original file without any modifications by a decompression algorithm. So uh, how, much, how much efficiency can we get? What is the best compression ratio that we can get? All right, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. And it's a question that really has provided one of the biggest success stories in information theory. Because what is behind uh, this particular software that you see there, or the PDF file on which the presentation is being uh, uh, projected. What is behind is an algorithm. It was developed in the uh, 1970s. That uh, It's a very simple algorithm to implement. It's a very low complexity algorithm, but yet it has the facet of yielding very beautiful mathematical results and has the facet of being able to show that this algorithm is actually optimal in the sense that it will get, give you the best compression efficiency. Okay? Of course, under some mathematical assumptions. Okay? Now, another facet is the facet of lossy data compression. Before, we were talking about an algorithm that will recover the data unaltered. Now, if the data is actually an analog signal, like sound or video or uh, photograph, then necessarily we cannot be totally uh, faithful to the data. We have to throw away some information, because we go from the analog world to the digital world. and. Um, you know, these are some of the examples of uh, this type of technology, but of course it's ubiquitous in, uh, in real life. Uh, now that technology of lossy compression also comes into the compact disk, because again, it's just an example of going from the analog world to the digital world. But on top of that, the compact disk is the first of several examples I'm going to give, where... Um, you, use, you add redundancy to the bits that you store in the compact disk in order to protect those bits from noise in the channel. Now you can think, well, what is noise in the channel? What is the, 
what does the compact disc have to do with noise? Well, uh, there might be fingerprints on the on the um, uh, on the surface, or there might be scratches, other imperfections. So at the end, what happens is that what you read is not what you wrote on the compact on the compact disc. So you have to protect the data in order to be able to uh, have uh, reliable um, storage. So at the end, what, what we see here is that storage and communication are the same problem. And in fact, Shannon recognized that in 48. In one case, you communicate across the space. In the other case, you communicate across time. But of course, the models are going to be different, but it's also a communication transmission problem. Same thing for uh, your hard disk. There is going to be a magnetic medium rather than an optical medium. But um, it's going to be a communication channel, which is subject to, again, dust. And also, it's subject to self-interference. There there's going to be interference from other tracks in the, uh, in the hard disk. So you have to cope with those using signal processing. Now, one of the early applications of error-correcting codes uh, started in the 1960s, the application of satellite communication. That's a communication channel the, where the signal-to-noise ratio is very low, the bandwidth is very large, but it's severely energy constrained. You don't want to have to put huge antennas when you send a probe um, uh, to the moon or Mars or whatever. So, um, a lot of the technological advances in, in error correcting codes came from that field of uh, satellite communication. In fact, uh, they said that satellite communication and, and uh, coding theory was a marriage made in heaven. Um, but of course, in the, in, the, in the last 15, 20 years, it's not been that way. One of the main drivers for the advances in, in this technology has been uh, cellular phones. And we'll get to that later. All right. So modem is uh, the modem technology is another one of the big success stories in uh, in information theory. It's one of the paradigms that Claude Shannon had in mind in 1948. And the problem there is how to send uh, zeros and ones through a channel that was designed for something else. It was designed to carry just voice band signals. So the interface between zeros and ones and real valued signals, continuous time, uh, real valued signals, that's what motivated Shannon to come up with some of his fundamental laws. And over time, um, you saw that the progression of the transmission rate in modems was kind of a linear time with, uh, with um, a linear function with time. And then at some point it flattened. And um, it uh, reached what we call, reached close to what we call the capacity of the channel. Now, of course, uh, that technology that was so important, now we don't really see that so much in the copper wire of the telephone channel, at least in its original bandwidth of sending voice band uh, signals. We see it more. DSL, for example, DSL just uses the same channel, but a channel that is capable of sending not just voice band, but sending even much higher frequencies, because at the in the in the telephone uh, station they will remove a low pass filter that they had only for voice band signals. They, they'll remove that if they if they know that what you're doing is sending a DSL signal. But the problem is essentially the same, using a channel designed for carrying analog signals to send zeros and ones. All right, so that's the, the problem I just mentioned of digital subscriber lines. Uh, the cellular uh, wireless um, communication system has, again, several aspects of what I have mentioned. It has the aspect of adding error-correcting codes to protect the zeros and ones from noise in the channel. And you can imagine that in that channel, there are a lot of sources of impairments, not just the thermal noise, but is a channel where the fading is a very important impairment, where you can go through huge differences in received energy, depending on 
where the phone is, and it's a channel subject to things like Doppler shifts and so on. But also, you see the aspect that we were mentioning before of lossy data compression in the sense that we um, uh, convert analog signals, voice signals, into zeros and ones. Now, it so may sound somewhat peculiar that we do that because at the end of the day, we start with a signal that is analog, voice, and at the other end, we want to reproduce a signal that is analog, voice, and we're going to do that through sending the, the, the signal through a radio frequency, and that's also an analog signal. So why should we convert that signal into zeros and ones at, that, at some point? Just like we do in the compact disc. Why, why would you, we do that instead of just keeping everything analog? And the short answer is really given by the 1948 paper by Shannon where he says, well, really, bits are a universal currency. So if you have someone as a designing a system to remove redundancy from analog signals, converting them into zeros and ones, and then you have some other guy who is going to design a system to add redundancy to these zeros and ones so that they are robust, when you send them through a noisy analog channel. If you put together these two uh, systems that have, one has been designed by a guy who knows nothing about channels and the other one has been designed by a guy who knows nothing about analog voice. If you put them together, there is nothing to be lost. You can still have a system that has the maximum efficiency. So that's a very powerful idea. It doesn't tell you that you must do it that way but it tells you that it's a very judicious way to engineer things, <coughs> let alone the fact um, uh, that by doing that, you can control very well uh, the trade-off between the fidelity you get and the resources that you spend in the system, like energy and bandwidth and so on. Now, here you have, you have another, um, another technology that we're all familiar with. That the reason why I show it here is um, mainly because you see that there are three antennas there, and that's another uh, technology that has been very influenced by information theory. The fact that by having uh, several antennas, you can uh, have better usage, better efficiency of how you use the bandwidth. And the idea is that in environments like the indoor environment, where you have signals that are bouncing from many different uh, directions, um, you want to combine those signals in a way that maximizes their energy, their energy usage. You see, of course, antenna rays in top of roofs. Those are UHF antennas for television. Of course, you, su you see fewer and fewer of those, or you see a parabolic antenna. Uh, those are directive antennas. Those are just antennas that are creating a directivity pattern in order to uh, get the signal from a certain direction, where that's not the way you use these multi-antennas here. You use them for diversity, for being able to combine uh, all these signals in, uh, in a robust way. And that's very much been influenced by information theory. That's one of the uh, directions in technology that is most important nowadays. So I've talked about some of this uh, already with uh, uh, these uh, few slides. Um, these are all technologies where information theory has played a major role as design driver, as a way for engineers to get inspiration of how they should design their systems. So I mentioned the first one, uh, universal data compression. Now, the, the word here, universal, comes from the fact that the algorithms that, like WinZip or PDF used, are smart algorithms in the sense that you don't need to tell them which source, which data they are compacting. You don't need them. You don't need uh, to tell these algorithms, look, the probability distributions of these sources are so and so. At the end of the day, what we do in information theory is exploit 
randomness, exploit knowledge of distributions, be it of the noise or be it of the source. But we can do that without prior knowledge. Why? Because we can learn from the data itself. We can just let the data speak for itself. We don't need to know anything. We don't need to have any preconceptions. Now, the technology of sparse graph codes uh, is also very interesting because that's, um, that's been a revolution that has happened in the last uh, about 15 years. And um, again, goes back to Shannon to 1948. Right? Imagine 1948, Shannon wanted to, to come up with a theory of what the best code could do, the best channel transmission code could do. But at that point, they had not invented even a single code. Optimal, non-optimal, good or bad. The only person who was closer to that was a colleague of his, uh, Hamming, uh, who about the same time came up with his famous uh, code where to four bits he could add three bits uh, and then be able to uh, recover from any single error. Okay? But that, of, that code, of course, is very far from being able to, to uh, reach the maximum capability of a channel. So Shannon had to come up with a, uh, a theory for the best code without even knowing how to design a single code. So what did he do? He said, well, I'm going to um, design a code at random. Out of the humongous space of all codes, I'm going to choose one at random with equal likelihood among all of them. And then he showed that if you do that, on average, the performance is above a certain level. Then he said, well, if the performance of on average, is above a certain level, there must be some code that reaches that level. And then he also showed that you couldn't do better than that level. So that's how he proved that um, he proved his fundamental theorem of channel capacity, of the fact that there is a certain number at which you can send information through a channel and achieve arbitrary reliability. If you try to send information faster than that, then the number of errors necessarily uh, grows unbounded. Okay, so at that point it may sound like it should be very easy to come up with codes because if you just choose one at random, you do a good job. But the problem is that uh, this theory is all in the realm of very long delay, very long codes. So imagine that you know the, the number of codes over which you need to search is growing very, very fast. But more importantly, if you choose one code at random, it doesn't have any structure. So you cannot find an algorithm that will encode and decode this algorithm in uh, this code in reasonable time. So then for a long time, it was a big challenge to come up with uh, error correction codes that would have reasonable complexity and that could come close to Shannon's fundamental limits. To the point that um, at some point people were even uh, doubting that Shannon's limits were relevant in the practical world because they thought, well, you know, maybe those limits require humongous amount of computation. Maybe we require all the atoms in the universe to have a, to build a computer that would be able to decode anything that uh, approaches those. So then the key turned out to be. Um, this is sparse graph codes that strike a good balance between Shannon's original idea of saying random code with, and structure, a code that has a lot of structure, like the Hamming code has a very nice structure. Structure enables you to demodulate, to decode and encode in a, an efficient way. And that's what these sparse graph codes are like, a good marriage between the two. Um, I talked about Boisman modems before. Discrete multi-tone modulation, that's the technology behind uh, DSL. And that actually comes, the, one of the key algorithms there, the algorithm that decides how much power you allocate to each different frequency, that comes straight from one of Shannon's papers. Not the 1948 paper, but the 1949 paper. 
Um, so that's what we call the water filling algorithm. Now, CDMA is very important technology for um, for mobile phones, uh, originated at the time of World War II, and again, Shannon was one of uh, its main proponents. The idea there is that the signals take a lot more bandwidth than their data rate, but uh, the, the side benefits of burning so much bandwidth is that then you can send signals simultaneously through the same frequency. All these signals are interfering with each other, but they have enough structure that you can have a, a detector, a receiver, that can make sense of them. Okay, and then this technology of multi-user detection, which Javier was mentioning in the introduction, is a way to uh, do what Shannon says that you, do, you should do in a channel. What Shannon says is that if you exploit the structure of the noise, if you know the statistics of the noise, then you can have much better capacity, much better rates. And that's exactly what this is doing using signal processing to exploit the fine detail in the noise. All right, so uh, we saw also multi-antenna uh, systems, how to actually create bandwidth in a way, make bandwidth just by having uh, different antennas. Uh, these error correcting codes that we talked about here, you can actually use not just time, but you can use different antennas also to give you um, degrees of freedom. And then there are some other technologies that maybe I'll, I won't go into all these details uh, uh, in the interest of time. Maybe the only one I will uh, mention is the last one here, secrecy uh, cryptography. Uh, Shannon, at the same time that he was working on information theory, he was also working on cryptography. I was during the, uh, the after the during the war and after, after the Second World War. So he actually published the most important. Pro uh, paper in cryptography, the, the most important theorem in cryptography that says that if you want perfect secrecy, then uh, the length of the key has to be as long as the message. If you're not prepared to have a key that is as long as the message, then you cannot have perfect uh, secrecy. So uh, the kind of cryptography technology that we rely on nowadays doesn't use that, doesn't, doesn't use keys that are as long as messages. Say, for example, if you have a Skype conversation that is all encrypted, but the number of bits in the key is way less than the number of bits you're sending. Um, so uh, it's all based on the belief that certain problems are computationally hard. Certain problems are NP-complete NP problems, and we don't know polynomial algorithms for them. And uh, probably no such algorithms exist, but if one day they are discovered, then all these, uh, all these um, cryptography uh, codes would be in, in trouble. So actually, information theorists have come up with a different way of measuring uh, secrecy. Uh, so you can, you can actually measure secrecy in a uh, quantitative way by ensuring that a potential eavesdropper uh, achieves very little information, information in the technical sense of information theory. And you can develop codes that will uh, trade off the rate of communication that you can send to the intended receiver for uh, secrecy against unintended uh, possible eavesdropper. OK, so now let me. Uh, show you some of the open problems in information theory. These are problems that have been around for many years, but I just want to show you this in order to give you a flavor. First of all, that I can explain some of these open problems just in words, and uh, we don't have to get into a lot of intricate mathematics, and to show you that you know, even for very simple things, after 60 years, we don't have an answer yet. And you know, as long as we have open problems like this, there will be people working on, on the field, uh, let alone the fact that, uh, that it's very technologically rele relevant. So here you can see Shannon uh, uh, in a picture when he, after Bell Labs, he became a professor at MIT. 
And uh, what he uh, showed in the picture here was some function, and you see that this function, he shows some shaded area, and that's because we don't know where the function is, so the function can be anywhere in that shaded area. And so this was probably from early 1960s, and nowadays, uh, 50 years later, uh, there is still a shaded area. This is smaller than... than uh, in that, uh, in that picture, but not much smaller. And this is, for the simplest channel you can think of, a channel that we call the binary symmetric channel that just flips a zero into a one with certain probability. So what is that function? Well, as you can see here on this, uh, on this axis, you, you see a C, that stands for capacity. So this, this axis is actually rate. So beyond, for rates above capacity, we don't have a function because for rates above, above capacity, we, he already showed in 1948 that you get garbage. But if you're willing to transmit less than capacity, for example, half of capacity, what are your rewards for doing that? Well, I would like to transmit as, as fast as I can. But then they, come up with, they came up with this refinement where they say, well, if you actually transmit at a fraction of capacity, then not only you can transmit data with a very low probability of error, but actually you can make the probability of error vanish exponentially with the delay. And how fast? Well, that's what this function is telling you. How fast with delay you can make the error probability go to zero. So that's still an open problem, believe it or not, uh, after all these years. You know, that's been a problem that is more of, uh, I would say, academic interest than real interest. Uh, a problem that is of real interest and also of academic interest is the delay error probability trade-off, but not in the regime of things going to zero exponentially fast, but maybe in the regime of being very close to capacity, because I indeed want to transmit as fast as Shannon tells me I can transmit, but maybe I have delay constraints, maybe I cannot afford but Shannon's theory is really an asymptotic theory, as I was saying. You know, it says, okay, this is what you can do if you're willing to send uh, block lengths of uh, billions and billions. But what if I can only send a thousand bits? And that's what happens, say, in real-time applications, where, um, you know, we have a block length of, say, a thousand, like in, in cellular phones. Uh, then I need to back off from what Shannon tells me I can do, but how much do I need to back off? So that's a, that's a very interesting problem, the non-asymptotic regime, and this is a problem where I'm actually working on this uh, now. Um, and it's tough because, you know, the nice formulas only happen in the limit. And non-asymptotically, you don't have as nice formulas, but it turns out that you can get nice and very accurate approximations, where you plug in those values, like block length equals 1,000, and then you get very, very accurate predictions. So, for example, here I have uh, this figure that illustrates that. You can see this is for a certain channel. This is called a binary erasure channel. And for block length 1,000, Shannon would say, well, the capacity is uh, 50%. So for every bit of information you send, you have to send another bit of redundancy. But that's only if you are if you're willing to, send, to spend infinite delay, if your block length is a thousand, then uh, the bounds we have uh, tell you that essentially the capacity is 45%. So it's a non-negligible backup from capacity. Okay, and this is another uh, picture. This is kind of like the view of uh, the state of the art. You can see here many different uh, curves. These are, these are for different uh, coding technologies. Some of them are the Voyager, Ca uh, Cassini, Pathfinder, Galileo. A lot of these are uh, deep space probes. And then these are codes that are used in, uh, in uh, turbo codes, used in wireless communications. And these are some codes designed at uh, Flareon, uh, which was acquired by Qualcomm. So these are the best codes right now. And this is in terms of block length. And we're plotting here is the normalized rate, normalized not with respect to capacity, what Shannon says you can do in the limit, 
but normalize with respect to this finite block length capacity, what you can do for that particular block length. So as you can see, we're still not so close to what you, we can be here, right? We can be here. And, you know, we're still getting about, um, say, for block length of 1,000, we're getting about 85% 80, of what we could get with current technology. Now, another thing that has been puzzling communication theorists is feedback. How to use feedback efficiently. And uh, you can imagine that the golden age of feedback was in the 1960s, 1950s, and so on with um, a lot of interesting advances in control theory, estimation theory, Kalman filters, and so on. Um, but somehow, you know, even though most communication channels you can think of are really two-way, not everyone, not every communication channel is two-way. For example, the compact disc, there is no feedback. There. But uh, say a cellular phone, you have a two-way communication. So maybe we could use the reverse channel, not just to send information in the other uh, in the other direction, but maybe to help, just to help the communication in the in the forward direction. So Shannon came up with a with a shocking result um, about 50 years ago. He said, "Well, suppose that you have feedback that is so brutal that the transmitter knows everything that the receiver knows." And he knows that instantaneously. So it's like you had a humongous, uh, a humongous bandwidth going back, where you could see everything perfectly without any any more noise being added. So then you could think, well, if I know what the receiver knows at every time, maybe I I can predict what the receiver is going to do. So maybe I can I'm. I'll be able to defeat the noise. Maybe the noise is driving the receiver to select some message, and I know that that's not the, re the real message, the true message. So maybe I can drive the, re the receiver to do something else by adapting the, 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 the transmitted signal. Well, so what was Shannon's shocking theorem? He said, well, if the, sh if the channel has no memory, then feedback is not going to help you. The capacity of the channel is the same. You can't go, get better by, by using feedback. Now, of course, that says, okay, so forget about feedback. Caveats is that, first of all, there is the condition in Shannon's paper that says, hey, if the channel does not have memory, if the channel has memory, then there is something to be gained by using feedback. And second, like everything in Shannon, is all asymptotic. So in terms of... Um, of finite block length, there may be something to be gained. And third, of course, it doesn't tell you anything about complexity. So it could be that the complexity that you need in order to achieve capacity with feedback is much less than what you need uh, without it. All right, so that's, that's, a still, uh, that's a still an issue that is uh, perhaps undergoing a, a, a renaissance in information theory. All right, so let me skip now to uh, multi-user channels. These are problems where we have either several receivers or several transmitters or both. And those problems are notoriously hard. For example, look at this. We have uh, two pairs of uh, source destinations, and there is crosstalk. Okay, so for example, just think of uh, twisted copper wires. There's going to be some crosstalk between uh, these copper wires. And uh, this one is only interested in sending information to this one. This one is only interested in sending information to this one. In the absence of interference, I know what is the maximum rate at which I can send this data. And uh, I know at what is the maximum rate at which I can, solve this, I can send that data. So. If uh, I want zero right here, I know exactly what is the best this guy can do and vice versa. But what if I want to have re positive rate for both transmitters? Well, I still don't know what is the best trade-off. Even in a simple channel like this, where there is just additive Gaussian noise on both sides. 
two-way channels, the same thing when you have signals that collide. Here there is a, this is a picture from a very old uh, paper on two-way channels. This is actually a, a NAND gate, I think, uh, where the output is the NAND of X1 and X2. Both, if there is anyone who knows about TTL, you can tell me whether this is a NAND gate or not. Um, broadcast channels, again, you have one transmitter and several receivers. And maybe you send just one signal, but this signal is heard by these several receivers, and you want to send different messages to each receiver. For example, you're teaching a course, and you have students who are very advanced and students who are beginners. And everybody's hearing the same, the same thing from the professor. And the professor wants to send different messages to different students so that everybody gets something out of the course. Okay? Or maybe we have a television antenna and that the same signal goes to low definition receivers, standard definition receivers, and high definition receivers. So you want some of them to pick up better signals than others. Well, we know how to solve these problems for certain models, but you know, there are very simple models for which we don't know how to solve these problems. The same thing when we have a relay, now we have only one transmitter and one receiver, but we have a helper in the way that is going to enable us to maybe lower the energy with which we have to send this signal, thanks to having this path. Again, we don't really know what is the fundamental limit there. Now, if you go to data compression, a lot of these problems that I was mentioning before have a counterpart in data compression. So one of the things I said before is that the fundamental limits are asymptotic. So if I have a very, very long text of information, then I can do a good job compressing it. And I, in fact, Shannon's limits, which tell me that the entropy of that message is going to be what is fundamental, apply. But what if I have very short messages? Like, for example, a tweet, a, a 140 character message. How much redundancy can I squeeze from that message and be able to recover it later? All right, so these are, uh, these are problems. Like, for example, images. Images, can you imagine that the, the issue of uh, lossless compression of an image is hugely important. But we still don't have good algorithms to do that. Okay. We still have uh, to learn quite a bit about, say, natural images. What is it that we can extract out of them? Um, all right, so I'll skip some of the others. Uh, this is just to show you, for those of you maybe who have taken a course on information theory, um, it's very easy to construct a source for which still we don't know what the entropy of the source is. So in this case, I have a source. This is, called what we, what, this is what we call a Markov chain. You can go from zero to one. You have some memory, so if you're already at zero, then you have, a, 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 say, a higher probability of staying at zero, and the same thing for one. So we know, actually, Shannon showed us how to compute the entropy of that source. But if now we observe this, that source through a binary symmetric channel, then we no longer know how to compute the entropy of that source um, for all values of these parameters. Now, in low-C data compression, remember the issue of going from the analog to the digital world. Now, there. The key question is what we call the rate distortion trade-off. So for a given distortion that you are prepared to, uh, to allow, what is the minimum rate that you can get away with to achieve that distortion? So instead of one number, like it was in the, in the case of capacity or in the case of lossless data compression, here is a whole function that you're interested in. Now here, the gap between theory and practice is wider than in the other two fields. So this is the third field uh, introduced by Shannon in 49. But by and large, the gap is still uh, much wider. So the people who design these systems, for example, who design MPEG or JPEG and so on, 
uh, some of that is driven by information theory, but not all of it is driven by information theory. Um, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, some of the reasons have to do with the fact that in information theory, uh, we need to have, in order to be able to write nice formulas, we need to have pretty simple distortion measures, like, for example, signal-to-noise ratio. But the human ear and the human eye don't care about signal-to-noise ratio. In fact, you can easily find examples where you, you measure a lower signal-to-noise ratio, but yet the signal, the, the image looks better than, than the other one that has higher signal-to-noise ratio. So we really need to understand the human eye and the human ear much better in order to be able to squeeze all the important bits out of these analog signals. But even, uh, even when we have very uh, simple distortion measures and so on, the constructive side of these theories is still quite a bit more primitive than in the lossless side or in the channel side. So here's another... Uh, Another application, this is the compact disc, but this is a uh, uh, Dodge gramophone had these four Ds, the, the DDD, you're familiar with that. Those are digitally recorded compact discs, but they came up, came up with this 4D because they were doing the analog to digital conversion at the microphone. So if you have a stereo, stereo microphones, you can imagine that these two compressors that are doing the compression at both microphones actually are compressing signals that are very, very correlated because the left and right have a lot of common information. So you could, in fact, exploit that and save bits. And how many bits can you save? So that is a problem that there's been a lot of advances in the last, uh, in the last few years. It's a problem that has been around for a long time, but some of the key advances have just uh, been published recently. Okay, so th these are some of the uh, of the gradients that I see in the field of information theory. Um, it's becoming a more constructive theory, um, more tightly coupled. No, so the fundamental limit side and the engineering driving uh, side are becoming more tightly coupled, and because of that, it's also becoming more applied. Uh, there are more and more systems where technology is already so ripe that we can uh, construct error correcting codes, uh, compression algorithms that let us do whatever Shannon says that we can do. So that creates a very nice synergy between the constructive side and the side of finding what are the fundamental limits. Every time there is more and more interest on multi-user applications. Um, several reasons. The tougher problems, a lot of them are still open. And also wireless. The wireless medium is inherently a multi-user medium. Mo universal methods, uh, methods where you don't need to pre-assume anything about the data, uh, where you learn uh, about the data on the fly. Even though a lot of the gains that we have in information theory are based on mm, statistical knowledge, as I was saying before, you can actually gain that statistical knowledge by looking at the source and learning it. Now, traditionally, especially from, uh, from a mathematical viewpoint, a lot of the mathematicians who have worked on information theory have been combinatorialists. So that... Every time I, I see less and less of that in information theory. And in fact, the main arguments are not combinatorial in nature. They are probabilistic in nature. Now, since 1948, uh, continuous time has been less and less important. Every time discrete time becomes more and more uh, prevalent. So, of course, that has to do with the fact that Shannon, actually, in that paper, in the 1948 paper, was the first time that he brought to the engineering field a crisp a statement of what we call Nyquist theorem, even though Nyquist really did not uh, come up with that result. It was known in mathematics before the result. You can express a, a bandwidth-limited signal by a discrete time uh, signal if you sample it at twice the bandwidth. 
Ergodic theory has been a mathematical discipline that has had quite a bit to do with information theory, even though if it's not a discipline that is related to applications, to optimization of communication systems or anything like that. Now, every time we see less and less of that. And then we see more and more intersections, um, intersections with other fields. For example, one of the things I've been working on uh, lately was intersections with estimation theory. So sometimes there are problems uh, where the only, uh, the only way we know how to show the answer to a problem that is non-information theory, problem is non-information theory, but the only way we know how to prove this answer is information theory. So it's a very nice marriage between information theory and other disciplines. So I think in the interest of time, um, I'm going to stop here. I was going to, I also had some more, uh, some more material on some of these intersections with other fields, but just to give you the message that um, the advances that uh, we've seen primarily in the last uh, 20 years or so in communications, by and large, are driven by mathematics. And by and large, the mathematics comes from the ideas that uh, were originated by Shannon in 1948. So even though this is a discipline that has to do with technology, something that was as old as uh, more than 60 years ago is every time more and more relevant because technology, as technology progresses, we can achieve those limits uh, with higher and higher efficiency. So with that thought, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, Tom. Uh, what do you see for you, you looked at multi-user communications your whole life. Uh, it's one of the uh, whole professional life. Because I remember when you were a graduate student interviewing for a job, that's what you talked about. Uh, what do you see as uh, practical advances that are still to be made in the field? I mean, how much better will our cell phones get? Well, um, you see, uh, still the way we use the, spe the spectrum is pretty primitive. So... Um, you know, if you just look at the spectrum in a spectrum analyzer, you'll see that most of it is unused. And is, there are these peaks, and then there is nothing in between. Uh, so, you know, if someone came from Mars and looked at uh, this spectrum, they would say, my God, these guys are, well, not from Mars, because I don't think they are very advanced there, but from some other uh, civilization, my God, these, are, these guys are really primitive. Uh, on how they use the spectrum. So I think a lot of it has to do with that, that we have to use the radio frequency spectrum uh, much more efficiently. But you see, the nice thing is that the demand for data rate is growing you know, exponentially, as they say, right? Because all these devices, the iPhone, the iPad, you know, people want to have connectivity no, no matter where they are. And every time it's going to be more and more uh, hungry of bandwidth. But the the real bandwidth, the radio frequency bandwidth, that doesn't grow, or maybe it grows from time to time. The FCC may release a few more uh, frequency bands. But the frequency bands that are usable for these purposes are definitely not unlimited. So that creates a huge economic in incentive for us to be able to do things in a much better way to use the technology that is already available to do things in a more efficient way. So it used to be that, okay, we knew what needed to be done, but we didn't have the technology to do it. Now it's the other way around. Now, or, you know, we, we know what can be done. We have the technology to do it, but we still have all these open problems where, you know, we don't really know how to use that spectrum in the most efficient way. So as long as there is this economic incentive, I think, People are going to be working on it and getting uh, better and better ideas. But it's very hard to, to predict, particularly the future. <laughs> yes? Uh, I searched on the net while you were talking, and I didn't find anything about flash coding a 
accepted a paper that you wrote. Can you explain what flash coding is? Flash what signaling. Is it, flash signaling rather, yeah. yeah, in a nutshell, um, is the kind of signaling that you could do with, uh, with, a, with the flash in your camera. So you could send information, not necessarily by modulating the intensity of that flash, but you send information in the times at which you flash the so camera. Like related to ultra -wideband yes, thing? very much, very much so, because you can imagine that that signal is going to have a, a huge bandwidth. So, um, so that actually is implemented in chips already. So this company, uh, I was saying, uh, Flarion, that had the best technology in error correcting codes, um, has implemented this idea of uh, flash signaling, and uh, it's it's uh, the technology that you need to use when you have uh, um, very low energy and you have non-coherent receivers that do not have face information. Then you, you are forced to, to do that if you want to be maximally efficient. But I see that we have to go because <laughs> they are waiting for us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.